he needs an introduction, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, Mulder Miller. Yeah. Yeah. on over 400 albums, and he knows how to play all of the keys, <laughs> and uh, it's been a big influence on a lot of uh, up-and-coming and older cats, and uh, he's a part of the, the, our, our history of music, and we're very honored to have him here. We had the great treat last night of having him, having him play at Sandbar with our combo, which was uh, masterful uh, performance, I must say, and tonight he will be performing at Snug Harbor with Herman Riley, Jason Stewart, and Derek Doge. So I'm sure that will be a great night, and I hope you guys uh, will be able to come. And right now, I'll turn it over to Mr. Mr. Groot. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Victor. Victor and I are old friends, uh, probably much older than uh, we think. <laughs> we met uh, a couple of decades plus, something like that. Mm -hmm. Older than some of them. Uh, I'm pretty, uh, yeah, so, uh, so I'm, I'm really happy to be back in uh, this uh, great city of music. You know, I don't get here enough, and I'd like to come more often. And, find out what you're all eating down here. <laughs> I know what you're eating. I, I just need to eat some of it. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so it's a pleasure to be here. And, um, um, the way I conduct these uh, workshops is uh, I generally play a little bit as I've just done and um, open the forum to a, you know to questions and, and that usually takes care of it because the audience usually have scores of interesting questions <laughs> and, uh, sometimes I have a challenge to find uh, the right answers a good answers even but um, I, I've done these a lot so um, I might have uh, at least some of the insight to, you know, to answer some of your questions. So, um, so there. So, if you have any questions, you do have any questions, then shoot. Did you start out playing jazz as a child, or how did you start? To I was develop? a teenager. Okay. About 14. I was playing before then. I started out playing uh, just hymns by ear. And um, I was about six years old. And um, I was born in Greenwood, Mississippi. It's a very small town right up the river there in the Delta. And um, there wasn't. Um, a piano teacher in the black community then, and um, one finally moved into town to teach uh, choral music in the, in the county. And um, he became our church organist, and therefore my piano teacher, my first piano teacher. And uh, I was eight years old, I think, and by the time you know I started. <clears throat> taking lessons. And I studied from then on through high school and a couple of years of college. And, uh, that's basically it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh -huh. So was uh, jazz and blues and different idioms that actually was started in the black culture, were they frowned upon for you to Learn. I mean, was that were you? Was that kind of suppressed to? No, not to. Want, yeah. not, want not in my house, you know. <laughs> um, I, you know, I played by ear, and I started playing the little songs I heard on the radio that those that I could figure out, you know. And um, 
Um, of course, you know, down here, and up there, in the Delta, you know, blues was in everything. You know, country and western, <laughs> church music, you know, everything had blues in it. And, uh, um, you were getting some modern jazz on the radio? No, no jazz on the radio. No. Just um, an infrequent appearance on television. And then there was there was uh, more jazz on television than there is now. Mm-hmm. You know, because I used to hear, you know, I used to see Duke Ellington, Nat Cole, uh, um, Earl Garner used to be on TV a lot, Louis Armstrong, and, um, you know, there's a lot more jazz than there is now on television. I don't understand why that is, but um, that's the way it is. You know, there was, and uh, I heard Oscar Peterson, the great Oscar Peterson, on television when I was 14. He was on the Dick Cavett show. And uh, I had never imagined a piano being played like that. I just, it was like another world to me. I never conceived of anything like that. And I heard that. And I was a different kid the next day. <laughs> That's what I want to do. And uh, I was about in eighth grade, so all of my friends thought I had taken leave of my senses. <laughs> you know, one day I was talking about Marvin Gaye and Al Green, and the next day I was talking about this Oscar Peterson guy. And uh, I was changed forever. And uh, so um, I can say that even in a little remote town like Greenwood, you know, remote as far as being removed from jazz, you know, um, um, one can be touched by it. You know, this music has far-reaching, uh, you know, effects. And, you know, It's been, it's been a great journey. And then you moved, you went way north and went to Memphis, right? <laughs> yeah, it was way north for me. <laughs> <laughs> and Memphis stayed, and uh, is it right, Memphis stayed? Or, yeah, Memphis And uh, stayed. that's where you and uh, James and Williams and Donald Brown and, and, uh, and, and uh, I, I'm interested to know a little bit about that. I know y'all got into a bit of trouble for at night in the practice rooms, pulling the pianos together in one room and, and, uh, and playing. Uh, I know that that must have had a big influence on your... I mean, was that where you first started to hear like more modern stuff? Because you've always kind of had a modern... Yeah, well, um, well, first of all, let me say that coming to Memphis from Greenwood was like coming to New York. From Memphis, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I saw a building with more than uh, two stories. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I freaked. You know, <laughs> you know uh, then you, when you drive into Memphis, there's, there was a, a big uh, Baptist hospital there. A, you know, about 15 stories. And uh, that was unbelievable to me. <laughs> I had never seen a building more than two stories. But um, also, but just that whole uh, episode about leaving Greenwood, it's a big thing for me, you know. Um, and uh, uh, coming to Memphis, you know, entering school, and, uh, <clears throat> and I met uh, two or three or four wonderful pianists. And, Two of them, uh, Victor just named, uh, um, a fellow named James Williams, who more or less, because he was older and and everything, uh, he sort of became my mentor. We became fast friends, and um, you know, James, uh, he was four years older, and he was doing everything I wanted to do. You know, he had his own group writing and arranging for the group and he had all the hip records and knew all the slick tunes and knew all the standards and uh, he was the guy to, to watch you know and to follow 
So I followed him like a puppy, you know. I wanted to do everything he did. And um, uh, another one of my colleagues, Donald Brown, who's a year older than I, uh, uh, Donald had been, uh, when I met him, he had been only been playing piano less than two years or so, you know. But he was already, uh, you know, a couple of leaps ahead of me, you know. <laughs> and he had this uh, immense grasp of harmony. You know, he had a sound about what he was doing that I was trying to get to, but I hadn't been exposed to it. And he was already doing these wonderful things. And, um, I found it amazing. And Donald, um, he was already composing uh, really uh, fantastic songs, music, you know, he was just composing. And he had, he had an ear, you know, that was unusually um, attuned to beauty, you know, same mm -hmm. like, uh, and he still today is one of the uh, Jazz great composers, unknown as is he? What's his name? Again? Donald Brown. Donald Brown. And uh, both both of these gentlemen preceded me in the uh, Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers group. That's a little later in the story, but um, we all kind of found ourselves in New York, and um, each of us eventually played with Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers. Uh, but Donald. Not a, he has a fantastic musical mind. And I always say, Donald, here's the beauty, beautiful things. And, and, and he plays beautifully and he writes beautifully. I'm um, going to talk loud because so I can hear me. Uh huh. Please uh, do. Pardon? Please do. Uh, thank you. Um, I spent a couple years in Vicksburg, which is about 10, 15 minutes north of the Delta, Vicksburg, Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I was there, I got, I got involved in some churches, some gospel churches. And um, the first time I went, I was a little bit late, and the people were singing something very, very beautiful. And the gentleman at the door said, sir, nobody goes in during the prayer. And then it was some, some melody kept going. It was almost like Tad Dameron. It was, it was. It didn't sound like that, but it was like it was kind of rooted in, in uh, cotton fields, kind of with, with some blues mixed in. But the melody kept changing, and they kept singing this beautiful thing all together in unison. And uh, the next time I made sure I wasn't late, I wanted to hear that. It was incredibly beautiful. I would, would break out in tears when I heard it every time. And. Um, they say started their service like there wasn't a professional musician in the place, what we call professional musicians. They were just mailmen and, and uh, river workers and whatever they whatever they did. But they all sang this thing in unison, very beautiful. The melody kept changing and it was I couldn't memorize it. Did they did you come across that? My question is, did you come across that in the Delta, in the Delta churches? Anything like that? Well, um, <clears throat> I'm not sure of exactly what you speak, but um, we used to have a thing uh, in, the, in the black church, for example. Uh, this is called the black church. Yeah, called, they call it Dr. Watts hymns. And um, <laughs> if any of you are a certain age, you know about Dr. Watts, you know, where uh, the minister or, or a person leads the chant. And, and he sings a line, and then the congregation picks up on them and yeah. sings that line. Answers. Yeah. Call and Call and that Call exactly. response. Call and response. And uh, um, it's incredibly moving. Mm -hmm. It uh, can be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I, I did it. And usually there's no instrumentation. Yeah, this I can tell us singing all the years. Yeah, Dr. Watts hymns. That, Dr. Watts hymns. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. That's what they called him. I never found out who Dr. Watts was. But, <laughs> but I I often wondered if 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 he was uh, 
there was a man that wrote hymns named Isaac Watts. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that's who they referred to or what, but um, yeah, that was that call and response. So that's uh, an incredible thing, you know. I, I would imagine it goes back to Africa. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about your move from Memphis to New York? I know you said that you and all your friends kind of all ended up playing with the Jazz Messengers, for, but was that serendipitous or? Did y'all put in good words for each other? <laughs> I don't know. Well, a little of both. Um, my own story is it's, that there, there was a lot that happened in between in a few years. Um, I left Memphis after about two years because I was uh, I was uh, anxious and eager to get to a, a more fertile um, jazz place, you know, happening, you know. And um, I didn't have any place to go, except for my friend James Williams who was teaching up at Berkeley School of Music. And um, in Boston there was a piano teacher that a lot of piano players uh, studied with her. Her name was Madame Shaloff. Um, she was the mother of, of uh, Serge Shaloff, a great bebop saxophone player uh, that played with Woody Herman, Serge Shaloff. But she was the mother and she played um, classical music. And um, she was this great piano guru around Boston that so many jazz guys studied with. You know, Herbie Hancock. Of course, Herbie was already professional. He, you know, whenever he was in town with Miles, he would go by and have a lesson. Uh, Keith Jarrett, when he was at Berkeley, he had a few lessons with her. And, um, um, uh, some of you young pianists may know about uh, Kenny Warner. Uh, he studied with her, and Steve Kuhn, and almost any pianist who arrived on the scene who had studied in Boston, you know, they studied with Al Gapper and so many others. And so, uh, because <clears throat> Herbie and Keith Jarrett had studied with her, I wanted to study with her. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, um, in my eagerness to get out of Memphis, I, um, at James's invitation, I went to Boston and stayed with him. Um, few months and uh, of course you know coming from the south uh, coming to Boston I had never been that cold in my life <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was so cold and um, I couldn't believe it and uh, so I stayed in Boston a little while and kind of worked around in the clubs and uh, Stead, had a few lessons with Madame Shaloff. And then after that, uh, uh, running away from the cold, I, I had a roommate that, well, uh, a high school buddy who lived in L.A. at the time. So he said, man, why don't you come out here? And so I, I went running to L.A., you know. Uh, on his advice and, you know, having the, the image of television in my mind, you know, Hollywood and Los Angeles, beautiful sunshine, you know, beaches and all of that. And uh, I don't really know why I went to L.A. <laughs> uh, well, I don't know then why I made up my mind then to go to L.A. In hindsight, I know, I, you know, everything has a reason, you know. And uh, so I went to uh, L.A. and I lived there a year. And then uh, I got the, uh, uh, the Duke Ellington Orchestra came to town after I had been in L.A. a year. Uh -huh. And I 
if I backtrack a little bit, before I left Memphis, I had worked in the Arlington Bay a couple of weekends, just on the, on the recommendation of a friend of mine that was working with the Arlington Bay. So, uh, but I hadn't seen them in more than a year. So I was um, in L.A., and, and and they were appearing at concerts by the city of Will on Jazz Club at the time. And so I just said, I want, I'd like to go by and say hello to the fellas, you know. And, um, <clears throat> and I went and said hello, and, and Mercy Ellington said, uh, well, where have you been? We've been looking for you for two, two years. And I said, well, I've been out here most of about a year. And he said, well, give me your number. And so... Uh, he called me in, in a few days and asked uh, if I could uh, go on the road for three weeks with him because uh, the guy who was playing piano then, he was, uh, his name was Lloyd Mayers and he used to do a lot of Broadway shows and singers and things and uh, you know he used to, to do a lot of money gigs so um, he went where the money was from time to time and so Mercer called me to to do three weeks, and um, three weeks turned into three years, and I was wow. on the road, you know, three years with Ellington Bay, oh. and so that carried me back, you know, to the East Coast. Everything I've read about people who played with the Jazz Messengers describe it as an education. That Blakey was a great educator. Could you tell us something about that? Well, uh, he mostly taught by example, not so much by what he said. That's you know, uh, Blakey felt like if you were good enough to be in the band, you were good enough to get it together without him badgering you. You know, um, he never really said a whole lot about the music. You know. Unless he had to, which he had uh -huh. to do from time to time, you know. And he would say things like, you know, don't uh, try to build your career off one solo or something like that. <laughs> you know, he would advise us against playing too long, he said, because you want the people to clap because you've you uh, played a great solo, not because you finished. <laughs> 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 uh, he say things like that, but uh, <coughs> but it, it, it was a learning school for a lot of reasons. First of all, um, he encouraged us all to become composers, to write, and to write for the band, and that that in itself was an education. And, um, you know, uh, by example, he taught us how to dress, because I was, you know, I was coming out of the 70s, it was still the age of polyester. <laughs> <laughs> and I had a whole wardrobe full of polyester. <laughs> I never owned a wool suit until I played with our lady, you know. <laughs> And um, <laughs> as a matter of fact, um, there are videos of me playing with Betty Carter, who I played with before, right before our Blakey. And in every video, I have, have these uh, polyester shirts, <laughs> <laughs> bell bottoms, you know. Just, well, I'm glad that age is over. <laughs> and, um, but uh, yeah, and our. Um, but the, the, the main thing I learned from Art, as well as every other great band leader I played with, Betty Carter, Woody Shaw, Tony Williams, um, was the thing about presentation. You know, uh, how to present the music, you know. In other words, you, you don't want to get on the bandstand and play for people and have it sound like a jam session. You know, people come to hear a certain kind of thing, and you want to present the music a certain way. You know, and that was that was probably the main thing. 
and uh, also observing him just being a, a great man leader. You know, he was just uh, um, he had the right uh, sensibility about most things. You know, when it comes to running a band, you know, he traveled on the road with us. He drove. Uh, as much as in it, the rest of us did, you know. And it was, uh, it was something to see. I'll get to you, but I think somebody told me. As a rhythm section man, how do you relate or want the, the bass and the drums to relate to, the, to, to your playing? What do you expect of the rest of the rhythm section? Or appreciate from them? <clears throat> well, I... Um, I think uh, fundamentally, I expect the same thing that most of anyone would would expect. And that is, uh, the drummer has to have have a good beat. That's first and foremost. The bass player has to play in tune and play the right notes. You know, and uh, he has to have a good beat and good time also. If I got that, I can have a good time. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't necessarily have to have a um, a virtuoso on either one. You know, that that's a plus. If you get that, that's wonderful. But if you get a drummer that plays good time, a good beat, a bass player that plays a good beat in the right changes, that's that's a big help. Now. The next thing I, I like to hear from a drummer is uh, whether he's a good interpreter. <clears throat> you know, a lot of young guys don't really know that uh, because it hasn't been pointed out to them. You know, when, when, when they listen to Art Blakey records, Art was such a great interpreter. But so was Philly Joe, and so was Roy Haynes, and so was uh, Elvin, and so was Tony Williams, and, and all the great ones. That's something they had in common. They're great interpreters. Um, <clears throat> and um, I got to see that firsthand, you know, playing with Art Blakey, because he was amongst uh, probably one of the greatest. You know, in other words, w what I mean by that is, say for instance, if we brought in a song that we had written, and uh, Art wasn't a great reader, but he would he would sit back and say, "Okay, you all go up and play it once," and uh, we play we play the melody. And he said, okay, play it one more time. Play it again. And then he said, okay. He'd come up and play, you know, drums on it. And he would do things to that melody that would be just incredible. I mean, things that you would, would never imagine. You know, I have a song that I wrote while I was with the messengers called Second Thoughts. And um, it's not a very rhythmic sound. A rhythmic song. It's uh, a l l largely sustained notes, whole notes, and very, very few rhythmic uh, phrases in it. But um, I remember him doing that when I brought it in. He said, "Play it once or twice." And when he came up to play it, he did things with those sustained notes that I couldn't imagine. And even today, when I play that with other drummers, I still listen for those things that Art Blakey did, you know. It was, it was just um, incredible, you know. And, you know, Roy Haynes has, has that same thing. When they play a melody, um, it's, some, it's something else. You know, it's not just, uh, you count it out, one, two, three, four, and they just play ding, 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 ding. You know, because um, a lo lot of drums do that. You know, they just play the time and, and uh, wait for the solos and that. But uh, 
those guys could make so much music out of the melody, you know. And plus, you know, we have to remember Art Blakey came from the big band days. He was, he was a big band drummer. And that, that was essential to big band drumming, was to play the arrangement, you know. So, but Art can make an instant arrangement, of, you know, in a moment, you know. Yeah, they're so great. As a matter of fact, there are a few guys from New Orleans that were messengers, you know. And then if you get us together, we talk about our Blake all day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, he was such a colorful uh, character. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, you had a question, Yeah, there? I was just wondering. You need to develop about this idea of presentation on on the, you know on stage. Present when, we, when you were saying about presenting the music to the audience. What does that consist of? Well, uh, it consists of um, ha- having a program of music that you that you have rehearsed. You know, and there's a some concept of presenting this piece of music, you know. There's some band concept, and uh, uh, with Art Blakey, uh, you know, uh, part of the concept of The Messengers was that it was a big band concept paired down to a small group, because Art was a big band drummer. And that's, that was part of the whole sound, you know. He just, just, just did all this wonderful stuff, you know, for a small group. And he had uh, uh, very talented and visionary composers in the band, you know, Benny Golson, Wayne Shorter, and Freddie Hubbard, and, you know, uh, Bobby Timmons. And uh, so uh, the band had always had music that was going to be presented in a certain fashion, you know. And uh, that is, I guess, to a degree and a sort of uh, um, adherence to uh, show business, you know. And they believe, Art was one of those guys, he, he, believed, he believed that um, uh, you weren't just an artist, you were in show business. Yeah. So, um, yeah. What do you require you to like uh, memorize the music? I mean, was that, was that part of uh, to see if you could play without reading? Yeah, or, or? Uh, yeah. Well, but if you were good enough to be in a band, you, you were good enough to mm-hmm. memorize the music for the most part. By the time I had gotten into the band, he had such a history of library, you know, had such a long, a large library of music that uh, sometimes uh, he had to go back and research if he was going to call something. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, one time in Boston, um, I was in the band and uh, we played in Boston. We hadn't been playing. Uh, New York, New York. Um, since I had been in the band, so it had been about two years at this point. And we came to Boston, and Donald Brown was in the audience, and he called New York. And <laughs> I was lost. <laughs> and Art, you know, uh, being somewhat from the old school, you know, he felt that. Uh, if you didn't know it, you will hear it. <laughs> so he said, uh, and, and Tara said, all right, Mulgrew doesn't know it. <laughs> he said, he'll hear it. <laughs> <laughs> well, this piece of music I'm talking about is really complex. They're, they're, they're very involved harmonically, you know. Oh, Donald's tone. Tune. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I... I don't ever want to hear a band leader say, he'll hear it. 
Somebody had a Did question. Oh, oh, I just. Uh, I'll, I'll take it. Okay. Um, I guess it might be um, after a bunch of questions, but I just wanted to hear one of your original compositions. You know, that you you like to put. <coughs> you know, either solo or trio or you know. Okay, I'll do that. Yeah. So, like, some of the questions I had have kind of been answered, like your time with art and what you look for within a drummer, because I play drums. But can you talk about maybe playing with Tony Williams a little bit? Um, if that's cool with everybody. And I was also <laughs> <laughs> and, and, no, proper <laughs> I know. and like also like your concept too, because I'm sure people want to know about your like your you know your concept. But just I don't know. There's a million questions, but I'd really like to hear about Tony. Like maybe a little bit about playing with Tony. Well, let me say, if I ever met Superman, <laughs> it was Tony Williams. <laughs> it was uh, the most unbelievable, uh, almost supernatural uh, musician that I've, I've ever played, met. You know, I mean. Uh, Wow. When I first joined the band, I just couldn't believe how good he played. You know, great, you know, because I had already played with Blakey and some other drummers. But um, uh, when I got on the bandstand with Tony Williams, it was like uh, it was indescribable. It was so much technique, so much power. So much intelligence, and sophistication of concept, and uh, uh, and as as I uh, went on and and uh, develop a re relationship, and, and, and I was able to see um, the the type of intelligence it, it was and. To see how he applied it to his his music. I mean, his involvement with with music was so deep, you know. And, uh, <clears throat> it was so much that he wanted to do. It was just he was just an incredible, you know. And, uh, so inspired. I mean, this is a man that every night. I was with him six years. Every night. Every night, it was amazing. Every night, but dig this: amazing was just the starting point. You know, so if you didn't go any further than that, it was still amazing. Would you be like, "Oh my God, I'm playing with Tony Williams"? Oh, I, <laughs> I have a story about that too. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, the thing about uh, th this becomes another thing, but uh, when I was playing with Tony Williams, you know, he's coming doing all this amazing stuff on the drums. And, uh, um, this when he had the big drum set. Like, uh -huh. Yeah, he was using the whole. Yeah. yeah. I I really had a complex. I had I had a Herbie Hancock complex because I didn't. St sound very much like Herbie. I had listened to him a, a, quite a bit and learned from him, as I did McCoy Tyner and Chick Corea and that. But I didn't figure out I sounded a lot like Herbie. And, uh, and uh, I had, had a pretty uh, a complex about it, you know. Man, this cat can come out here every night and listen to me play piano, you know. And after playing all those years with Herbie, you know. And uh, um, this went on for a couple, couple of years or so, and I just, I just uh, felt uh, so uh, un everything, <laughs> you know, um, inefficient. Uh, yeah, I just did, uh, you know. Uh, 
but at the same time, I didn't really want to want to sound like Herbie. Yeah, he sounded great. He said, you know, I I probably would have if I could have, but I didn't believe that I should sound just like him, you know. But still, I had this complex, you know, and so. Um, I carried this complex around for a couple of years, you know. And then uh, on tour one time, we found ourselves in Chicago. Uh, 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 we were playing at uh, Joe Siegel's Jazz Showcase, you know. And so I have a friend in Chicago uh, who is a bit older than me. As a matter of fact, I met this guy in high school. And, uh, and he, he was a, he lived in Chicago, but um, he played trumpet. Well, really, really, he owned a trumpet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> much trumpet. But this, this guy, uh, very nice guy. He he knew all about the history of Chicago. Anything you wanted to know about Chicago, he you know he, he had it down and. Uh, 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 he, but he liked to talk, and uh, the nickname that his friends gave him was Mouth. <laughs> so, so Mouth called me one morning, <laughs> and he said, uh, "Mogul, what are you doing?" I said, "Well, I'm just laying up in the, in the bed, chilling, <laughs> you know." And he said, uh, why don't you uh, let me come and pick you up and take you around Chicago and show you, you know, some, a lot of interesting places and, you know, some interesting things about Chicago. And, uh, I said, oh boy, <clears throat> we got to deal with mouth all. <laughs> So, uh, I, but I, I thought, well, okay, it's, it's a Sunday morning and I'm not doing anything. So, I told him, okay, he came back to pick me up and he drove me around Chicago. And, um, and I tell you, Chicago is really one interesting place if you really get to see it. Like New Orleans, it's, you know, it's just, it's just something to see. But uh, he drove me into a neighborhood called Hyde Park in Chicago. And Hyde Park is the home of Herbie Hancock. It's where Herbie grew up. Hmm. And it was um, in Herbie's time in the 40s and 50s and the early 60s. It, it was um, um, upper middle class black neighborhood mostly, you know. And um, I was riding around, and in my mind's eye, I could see what uh, the neighborhood like, looked like and get a feel for it in Herbie's time, you know. And uh, uh, a lot of prominent black people still live there, you know. Uh, Muhammad Ali had a house there, Louis uh, Farrakhan, and some others, you know. And um, uh, I know that Herbie in his upbringing, you know, he had certain things that were cultural, culturally beneficial. For instance, he played with the Chicago Symphony at uh, 11, year, 11 years old, you know, some kind of hiding piece of Chopin or something. He played with the Chicago Symphony at 11 years old, you know, some kind of children's program, you know. And um, and you can see that, you know, the schools and everything probably at that time were, were just superior to uh, other schools and just uh, an upbringing that was on another level, you know. And I, and I took a look at that and I said, uh, Wow, this is Herbie Hancock. You know, this is why he plays like he does because of the way he was brought up, that cultural upbringing. You know, uh, 
where his, his uh, intelligence was uh, cultivated and, and all of that, you know. He had access to all of the, the cultural things, you know, classical music and whatever else have you, you know. And I said, well, this, this is why Herbie Hancock plays like this. And then I said, that has nothing to do with me. I didn't come from that. I came from Greenwood, Mississippi, cotton fields, mm -hmm. you know, Methodist and Baptist churches, and there was nothing like a, a symphony orchestra. <laughs> You know, marching band was about concert band was probably the closest we had to. I said uh, it would be a complete lie for me to get on the bandstand and sound like Herbie Hancock. You know, and uh, I said Herbie Hancock is telling his story. Now you've got to find out what your, what your story is and be true, truer to it. I was I was pretty much telling my story anyway, but I wasn't I wasn't uh, at home with it, you know. I felt like I should have been doing something else, and so I decided at that moment I was going to tell my story through the music, you know. And During your time with Tony, yeah. Huh? Well, this is with with, with, with Tony, Tony yes. yeah. And so the I, concept I, thing and the Tony thing kind yeah. of yeah. So right then and there, I resolved my complex about that. Uh, you know, I said, well, you know, because Tony hadn't complained to me about yeah what I was doing. It was just that thing I was living with, you know. And so um, that's part of that. And then a couple of weeks later, I went back to New York, and um, you know made my rounds, you know, on a night off you go and to different clubs and I made my rounds one night and I went to three clubs and heard three different piano players. They were all young and very talented, very good. They were all trying to sound like her being a guy. And not one was close. <laughs> <laughs> you know, not one was close. And they sound, they all sounded like third rate or fourth rate Herbert Hancock's, you know. <laughs> and so I said, wow, I'd rather sound like a first rate Morgan Miller <laughs> than a fourth rate Herbert Hancock. <laughs> and, uh, now, don't get me wrong, if I could sound like a first rate Herbert Hancock, I probably would. <laughs> you know? I mean, I, I think the world of Herbie, you know, but. Uh, That was one of the greatest lessons I, I learned. That I, you have to be you. You have to tell your story. So, what if a guy's from like the middle of the desert? Does he? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that say, it again? <laughs> say it again. I said, what if a guy's from the middle of the desert and he grew up around no culture whatsoever? <laughs> well, I was almost there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Nowhere, man. Like, pretty close. Do you, do you find that that's, that's kind of being lost uh, today where, you know, like the thing you just described, Absolutely. where so many people try to imitate Absolutely. someone else, and it seems like it's always been historically well, like, you you know, you were expected to be yourself and, and have your yeah. own concept. I mean, so. but, but uh, uh, don't, don't get, get me wrong, there was always that element, though. Mm -hmm. so there were scores of Charlie Barkers, of people who wanted to be mm -hmm. Charlie Barker. Right, right. And... Uh, I mean, it's quite natural that someone so brilliant uh, would be influential. I'm not, not knocking that, you know. I, you know, you know uh, it's quite understandable why a hundred thousand young piano players would want to play like Herbie Hancock, you know. It's the slickest thing out, you know. Yeah. So, um, but uh, I think uh, maybe because the way the music is taught today and so forth and so on. Uh, um, well, individuality is not encouraged. And uh, 
And, you know, I, and I, I, I have a close kind of, uh, I have close feelings about this because I'm a teacher also. Mm-hmm. And um, I always try to make sure I don't direct the student in that way. You know, I don't encourage the student to only listen to this. All of this. I encourage the student to listen to everything. Keep your ears open and um, take in everything. And, and, and then give, give him the option of what he wants to sound. You know. And still, his education has barely started because it doesn't really start until he gets out and he has to play in front of the audience. And then then he feel like then you'll know what what's what, you know. Mm-hmm. All those transcriptions you play to you sometimes you you know you have to know how to make music out of it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you had a question at what time? Yeah, well I was gonna wait to the very end because probably nobody else is interested in this. This lady you mentioned in Boston, Madame Shorkoff? Shalov. Shalov. Um, she, you said she was a classical pianist, and all the jazz guys went to her for a few lessons. What would she offer them? What would she, what would she teach them? Uh, well, she, she was, as I mentioned, her son. Yeah, uh, Yeah, uh, Sir Shalov. So she had a certain kind of... Uh, Empathy for for the jazz musicians, you know, and uh, uh, a lot of pianists at that time had not really studied, you know, as much as they do now. I think, oh. you know, I mean, it was um, out of the ordinary to hear virtuoso in the, at, in those days, you know. Now they come down down a dozen. You know, I, okay. I hear pianists 20 years old, I mean, from everywhere. They can do amazing things. Mm-hmm. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. But she had a special thing. Um, conceptually, what she taught was uh, to make the piano sing. Mm-hmm. That's, that's what her big thing is, to make the piano sing. Because a lot of pianists at that time wasn't thinking about that. Mm-hmm. You know, they uh, kind of approached the instrument as it is, as a percussive instrument. Mm-hmm. You know, and so to develop a technique and a, and a mental concept of having the piano sing, that's. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Can you talk a little bit about uh, playing solo piano and how you might choose uh, treat standard tunes? How you prefer maybe for a solo piano? Yeah, well, uh, I don't necessarily feel like uh, that uh, I'm all that equipped to be an authority on this solo piano because. I, I do it, you know, but uh, uh, it's not something I, I work on, you know, a lot, mm-hmm. really. And so uh, I guess basically what I can say is, um, you know, my solo piano playing, hopefully, uh, it sort of reflects. Um, the music I've heard, you know, from Art, Art Tatum and Oscar Peterson and, and uh, Hank Jones and others that have played wonderful solo piano. And uh, it uh, re- reflects the things I know, you know. And so basically it re- re- reflects all that I know about the piano and, you know, so I don't know if there's a single path that every pianist should go down, you know. 
And apparently they haven't because Bill Evans didn't play so low piano like Oscar Peterson, no Bud Powell, you know. Uh, Bud Powell didn't play a uh, solo piano like Oscar Peterson. And, uh, so you have to, uh, <clears throat> I guess, one solo playing will would reflect how they feel about the instrument. You know? uh, I remember hearing you play. Um, when I something when I take a walk or uh, is it oh. Tatum? Yeah. Would you Would you would, like to take Would you like to take like a walk? To... I mean, you must have been in your early twenties and you were playing like Tatum and stuff back <laughs> then. I mean, maybe it was. I mean, was it through transcription? Was it through osmosis? <laughs> you know, it it certainly was. Wasn't, wasn't through transcription. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I remember yeah. you saying one time that you, when I was working on a transcription, that you hadn't really gone about it that way. That you, you yeah, know, read some, but that I guess through just yeah, you know. I, uh, uh, transcription was not a thing that I really got into. Now, but I will say this: either whether you are a transcriber or not, you have to listen. And by listening, uh, you know, transcribe means to write. You write down what you hear. And the only difference is I didn't write down what I heard. But I heard it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I guess in a way you kind of miss out because uh, even though you understand it at the time, you may not necessarily remember things in a chronological order. Like, for instance, I I can't play you eight bars of no one solo. Not even my own. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, you know, there's some solos on record that I've studied over and over and over, and I make sure that I, I understand what they're doing when they're doing it, you know, when, I, when I'm hearing it. But I never copied it. And, Tried to make it my own. You know. Yeah. Would you like to take a walk? Right. That's a, that's a beautiful setting. Yeah. yeah. I, but I, but um, oh, before I graduated high school, I had an Art Tatum record, and um, I used to put it on when I went to bed. And in those days, they had the you know the turntables. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Play the record and then <laughs> automatically yeah, you know, go back over. to the front and then and so all night I was hearing this record you know, <laughs> and I went, woke up in the morning and it was still playing you know? <laughs> so uh, uh, I, I guess uh, sort of uh, subconsciously or whatever it is it might have slipped in there some kind of way <laughs> You've done a, like, a lot of recording. Are there any techniques that you have when in a studio? Are there any techniques you have to try and bring what you play on the bandstand? Are there any techniques? Um, so like adjust to different, uh, different studios? And there is an adjustment. But um, I, I wish I could say yes. I wish, I wish there were some techniques that I knew that would help me because I I've really had a, a kind of a hard time with the studio kind of thing and um, all I can tell you that it, it has gotten better through experience you know, of doing so many records and doing it over and over and over and over till now I'm fairly um Comfortable in the studio most of the time, but uh, I've I've really had a rough time with that, you know. And I don't know; it must be something in each musician's personal uh, psychological makeup. Because I mean, I know some guys coming in the studio and they, they play like they play at home, or, you know, in the clubs and. Uh, but um, some musicians, now I'm uh, friends with uh, 
the record producer, Orrin Keyes, who used to own uh, Riverside Records. And uh, he said uh, two of the musicians that were difficult in the studio were Sonny Rollins and Wes Montgomery. And they were not that comfortable in the studio. And uh, you wouldn't know it from listening to their records, though. <laughs> So all I can say that um, just having having done it at, 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 having done it over and over over through the years, um, plus just becoming more confident uh, through experience of playing. You know. Hey, how did you? Um, how, what, what was the process? I guess I mean your your your. Did you develop your sound when you were younger? I, I, I got to hear you with Tony, and I got to hear Blakey, and I know they were loud. <laughs> so I don't know, it's, and, and, and having a big sound is not necessarily loud, but I mean, was it early technique that you that you had? That I me mean, have all these big hands, and you're a big fella, so I don't know if it's <laughs> that, or is it something that you, you know, how do you maintain, how do you, how do you build your sound? Was it something you've heard in your ear and developed? That's a good question because I've never, um, you know, I've never uh, said that I have a big sound. To me, I don't have a big sound. I, it's You've heard other people say it. Huh? You've heard other people say it, I'm sure. Yeah, I, I'm always surprised <laughs> by that, you know. It's, it's, just, it's never big enough for me. Uh -huh. And... Uh, but I, I'll say this, uh, uh, your sound sort of uh, reflects what you hear in your head first, mm -hmm. you know, the sound that you hear, and uh, uh, when you strongly hear a sound, I think your body uh, makes the adjustments to produce that sound. Mm -hmm. uh, that's first. But there must be a uh, certain kind of practice, you know. And I, I know for sure that through uh, practicing, that that helped my sound. Anything in particular? I know no. that the diminished thing, that's a great job. Well, that's one right of the now, greatest but, uh, things. But, uh, you know, in different phases, I've, I've gone through different things. But uh, that's one of the biggest things that helped my technique. Okay. Uh, um, this set of exercises by Isidore Philippe. Mm -hmm. um, you see, I got to a point that uh, I didn't feel like Hannon was, was no longer helping me, you know. And so, um, and I forget who turned me on to this, but uh, uh, this book of exercises, it's all in diminished uh, chords. You hold some notes down while you raise the others. And so and you do it chromatically and, um, and build your technique. And, uh, and I found for, for me it helped my sound too. But uh, yeah, but it, uh, above all, it, it, it uh, reflects what you hear in your head. You know, if you don't hear a big sound, you're probably not going to get. It. Awesome. Any, anybody else? Um, you're obviously better than you were when you started playing piano, but. <laughs> Is, was there a period where you improved drastically over a small period of time, or was it more gradual? Kind of it was basically gradual, but um, there was a phase where I think um, I made leaps, and that was a phase where I was playing a lot in New York at a club called Bradley's, mm -hmm. yeah. and. Um, 
You see, because uh, up until that time, I had mostly been playing in bands where I was a side man. So I never got to play melodies. You know, I knew all these songs and didn't know any in the, in the melodies, especially in the bridge. <laughs> so, you know, I knew all the right changes and everything, but I couldn't play any melodies. And, uh, so uh, when I uh, got to do these kind of gigs, I was, you know, doing a duo, me and a bass player, or trio gigs, and I was playing the melodies more. And, um, and Bradley's was, was a kind of a place, it was, you had to do your best because you never knew who was sitting out there. You know, you know I, you'd be playing and there was a table at the end of the piano. You know, you might be playing Look Up and uh, Tommy Flanagan or <laughs> Kenny Barron would be standing at the bar uh, and so on and so on, you know. So it was never, you could never really, uh, uh, you know, Relax <laughs> uh, about you know about what what uh, level you were playing. On. So um, I think I grew a lot during those years, uh, and not just Bradley's, but it was a couple of other clubs in New York like that. Uh, but playing duo, I think it developed certain strengths. Do you know Don Poe? Very well? Fairly well. Uh, he used to, uh, Don Pullen used to call me uh, Killer Miller. <laughs> <laughs> and I used to call him uh, Fist of Fury. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he had uh, and uh, yeah. Okay. Really? <laughs> You're gonna play us a Yeah, okay. Um, quite some years ago, uh, you know, travel when you travel on the road, uh, so many things happen. And uh, one of the greatest things about being a musician or any other kind of person uh, is the chance to travel. Get you just learn so much and experience so much, and when you travel, you run into all kinds of people that knows all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. You see all kinds of sights, and um, so uh, I, I dare say, if anybody goes on the road for 20, 30 years and still remains the same. Person he is at that thirty years, he didn't do it right. <laughs> you know, you know. After you, after you, after you have seen the world many times and seen different kinds of people, you know, you should be a different type of person when you come away from that experience. That is, uh, unless you had that kind of experience um, growing up in, in a kind of cosmopolitan kind of situation, which a lot of us don't have. I mean, you know, I came up in a little town, I lived on one side of the tracks, and that's all you were exposed to. Well, you take that, you know, that, that was good. But, you know, you have all of those other uh, broadening kind of situations. and uh, So, Anyway, I, I ran into uh, people that were reading all kinds of books and religious and philosoph philosophical books and all kinds of things. But um, as a re result of that, uh, I uh, had a sort of a revelation about dogmas, D O G M A S. And, uh, and how we are stilted by dogmas, you know. And um, 
Anyway, I said that as much as possible, I was going to do away with dogmas. So I wrote this tune called Farewell to Dogma. Mm -hmm. Hope I can play it. Thank you. 
Can I just ask, uh, what would be your like your top three favorite books? My three favorite books? Yeah, or one. Good job, good job. Ah. <laughs> Wow, that's a tough one. Um, I can tell you the book that has...